as rain falls from the sky, so it absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. And that turns it into a weak solution of carbonic acid. Now one feature that makes limestone a very special rock is that it can be dissolved, absorbed by such an acid. The evidence is clearly there to see on the limestone pavements of the Yorkshire Dales. The limestone is laid down in distinct, nearly horizontal beds, but it has vertical weaknesses in it too, formed by the crystalline nature of the rock and cracks from the pressures exerted upon it. We call these joints. The water has opened these up into deep vertical fissures. Some of the other erosion features can be astonishing. All of these openings enable the rainwater to find its way deep underground. So when the streams that gather on the hills come into contact with the limestone rock, they often dramatically disappear below the surface. Over thousands of years, an underground stream can open up a network of cave passages deep underground. Limestone caves are one of the hidden but most magical features of the limestone landscape. Deep below the surface, streams, sometimes rivers, can run in complete darkness. In the valley, the water re-emerges as springs, giving little indication of the drama of their underground journey. Glaciers played an important role in the underground landscape too. During the first ice age, huge sheets of ice, hundreds of feet thick, covered all but the highest peaks. The ice was moving, slowly but relentlessly, and as it did so, it ground away much of the overlying rock, and consequently uncovered large new areas for the Great Scar Limestone. As the ice melted, huge volumes of meltwater would have cut deep valleys. But once it had washed away the debris left by the glacier, water was already coming into contact with the rock. At first, it filled the existing vertical joints and any horizontal spaces between the bedding planes. Once an outlet down in the valley was established, a continuous flow of water could begin, slowly at first, but gradually opening up the series of fissures, eroding away the limestone and forming an underground stream passage, a river cave. However, the glaciers were to return, this time in the form of valley glaciers. The groundwater became frozen, and passages that once thundered to the sound of water became virtually silent. The passage of the valley glaciers cut the valleys much deeper and much broader. When they'd gone, many of the old cave passages were blocked by debris from the glaciers. Once again, meltwater found its way underground, sometimes utilising old passages, sometimes creating new. New, deeper routes were now being opened down to the valley floor. Some of the old pastures became abandoned and a new process could begin, 
the formation of stalactites and stalagmites. In places, tiny cracks enable water to drip, drip, drip from the roof. As each drip hung there for a few seconds, so water evaporated from it, forcing it to deposit a little of the limestone that had dissolved on the way down from the surface. It was in the form of crystalline calcium carbonate, a deposit we refer to as calcite. It was deposited in a ring around the circumference of the drip. The ring grew drip by drip. The result is a formation we call a straw stalactite, simply because it's hollow and not unlike a drinking straw. However, in some circumstances, the crystal growth can block the tube. The water is now forced to either filter through the walls of the straw or flow down the outside. The straw then starts to grow outwards as well as down, forming the more familiar stalactite shape. Meanwhile, on the floor, another process has been going on. The formation of stalagmites had begun. Once more, the evaporating water was depositing calcite, but this time the growth was upward. All of these processes are incredibly slow. A few centimetres of growth can take thousands of years. Nevertheless, in some places, the stalactite and the stalagmite can eventually meet to form what is known as a column. In places too, calcite can cover the whole floor. Crystal buildup around the edge of pools can also create a series of natural dams known as rimstone pools or gores, sometimes looking rather like a terraced hillside. Areas of cave floor can even become covered with large but delicately beautiful calcite crystals. There are other variations on the ceiling too. These are curtains. They appear to form when a drip trickles along a surface. The line of the crystal growth is now outward. When a light is shone through these crystal structures, bands of colour caused by impurities in the water clearly show the layers of growth. Another stalactite form is more difficult to explain. These are helictites, but how they seem to defy gravity is not easily explained. Whatever, these natural grottos can be stunningly beautiful. Throughout the world, there are underground landscapes that can be just as breathtaking as anything we see on the surface. Most of them, of course, are not accessible to the general public. However, there are a few places where the public can experience a little of the underground world. Stump Cross Caverns, for instance, where parts of this film were shot, has been open to the public for many years. Of course, the majority of our caves can only be explored by properly equipped and experienced cavers. Cave exploration can be a challenging, uncomfortable, and sometimes dangerous pastime. Under the valley of Nidderdale runs one of Britain's finest river caves. The Goyden pot system probably dates back to the first ice age 
and it carries one of the largest underground streams in the country. Many kilometers of passages have been explored, but this cave can be dangerous. A flood can make many of these passages impassable. Some places fill to the roof. Those that do venture underground need to treat our caves with the same respect and the same care that should be given to our landscape above ground. It is sometimes too easy to forget that our precious underground heritage is every bit as much a part of our limestone inheritance as our landscape on the surface.